guys, uh, Brian here from Starlight Pulp. Thank you so much for coming by. Uh, appreciate it. And tonight I have uh, Mr. Quay Corte on with me, and he is a very distinguished individual. First off, a mystery author of some renown, but then also a uh, former medical doctor, um, which is not a combination you see very often. <laughs> uh, so he, he he's also got two major uh, detective novel series going. Uh, one with protagonist uh, Darko Dawson and the other one with Emma John. So we're going to uh, talk all a little bit about that. But first off, Quay, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing good. Thanks Excellent. Good. Excellent. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have you on, man. So first off, uh, you were born in Ghana. Um, a Ghanaian father. Right. American mother. Right. Uh, what led you in that household to becoming a writer? Well, um, both my mom and dad were, were academics. They, they taught at the um, <clears throat> University of Ghana. And so we grew up actually on the university campus. Yeah. And between the two of them and then plus the children's book books, there must have been at least eight, eight or nine hundred books in there. Mm -hmm. um, including my, my mom's, uh, um, you know, recipe um, volumes in the kitchen. So sure. uh, I, and I was really drawn to, to books. And in, the, in those days, it was, um, it was normal for you to go and run out and play, of course, which is the opposite now. Um, <laughs> yeah. And the nerds were the ones that, that, that stayed in. So, mm -hmm. so, yeah, so I was, no, I was no soccer expert. I was just Mr. Bookworm. Right. And, um, you know, even from them, e e either from that, even from that um, really early age, I just gravitated towards, you know, mystery, um, uh, murder mysteries. You know, I, I, I went with um, Agatha Christie, um, sure. Dorothy Sayers, and of course, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And, um, and yeah, those, those, you know, those were a lot of my inspirations. But what was missing was there wasn't a single, you know, West African equivalent of, say, sure. <laughs> Doyle Sayers or, you know. Sure. You know, so that, that was what was missing. And, and is that, you, you tell me, because you know more about it than me for sure. Is that, some, is that because there weren't any or because you didn't have any in, in the collection? Um, both. Well, okay. But there weren't there weren't any mystery writers in West Africa that I know of. At, certainly that were published. Okay. Okay. They definitely were not. Okay. And even now, um, West Africa falls behind, say, South Africa in their production of mysteries and thrillers. Okay. There's a whole bunch in South Africa. Dion Mayer. Um, Jesse McKenzie, so many of them. Excellent. And all what we have in West Africa basically is um, Lele Ayenne, mm -hmm. who is uh, Lele Ayenne, sorry, I mispronounced it, okay. who is Nigerian, mm -hmm. um, and then myself, and then one, one other who I believe um, is from one of the Francophone uh, countries. Okay. So, yep. Then it was, you know, very very far and few between and now it's a little better but not okay. all the way it should be sure okay yeah okay and one of the things you touched on there that i think is interesting because uh you mentioned that you you grew up in a house full of books right yeah like you can see back here too my yeah my, um, when, that's what that looks like when i right when i uh when i grew up with with my mom and dad it was it was books all over the place and i swear yeah. i think i i'll 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 bet you that probably, I mean, I don't know, 80, 90% of people who later become writers grow up in environments where there's books all around. Yeah. You know, yeah. like it, it would be, it would be strange, not strange, but it would be rare, I would think, yeah. for, for, for somebody to grow up in an environment without books. Yeah. Because the grow books, up and go, I the books are the stimulus. The yeah. books are the stimulus. And that's where it all, it all started. Um, it all starts. So, um, yeah, def definitely um, it's, it's and, and the other thing is that, you know, both my parents, my, my dad was a writer, but nonfiction. Okay. Yeah. And um, 
he, I, I, in some ways, I think I learned the craft of, you know, starting a project and finishing a project, you know, and working as long on it as, as, as you could. My father wasn't fast, but he was mm-hmm. okay. And um, I, so I learned a lot of stuff from him. Sure. And then my mom, my mom was very encouraging, you know, about reading. And then also when I started creating my own <laughs> Uh, sure. mystery solvers at the age of you know eight or nine right she was very very encouraging you know mm-hmm. uh, for that kind of thing and that that's that's the kind of thing that you that that a child needs that you know sure. positive affirmation uh-huh. that you're doing good you're doing absolutely good. i think yeah absolutely i i wrote a book um in i was in elementary school so it also had pictures okay yeah. Um, yeah. I, I used to do that too I yeah yeah and and it was called uh, the first one I remember. It was called the cockroach that ate New York. Uh huh. And, <laughs> and I was I was I'm gonna say eight or nine somewhere in there. Yeah. And and you know I had it, there were crayon drawings in there and really and, you know lots of details. But yeah, I mean it it's and you said you started early too. Yeah. Yeah. I was I was I either you know two who typed it on the <laughs> on the keyboard uh-huh. as I wrote it longhand it's a, a combination of both I still somewhere I still have a, a couple that my mom actually kept mm. um, I had one called a fishy story where where a uh, a woman le- loses a necklace while she's you know aboard a ship and after their fishing trip, you know, when they're skinning over oh, <laughs> the fish open, the necklace is in there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <It's> appreciated. <laughs> yeah. Well, well that's that was one of my, uh, my, my, uh, I guess you could say the stories with a twist at the end. So, right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. That's yeah. far more advanced than my early fiction. So that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's good. Oh uh, yeah. So, <laughs> okay. So, so you have two main protagonists in, in the series that you, are are currently uh, still writing, right? So you have Darko Dawson and you have Emma John. Um, talk a little bit about each of them, and then mm. also kind of you know where they came from uh, in your structure. Yeah. So Darko Darko Dawson, um, which is a series of five books, and then Emma John so far is a series of three, with the one mm. coming in February, and. Uh, I think four by 2024, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. We'll Good. see. Good. Um, and I started with Darko in 2009. I was still a practicing physician. Okay. At that time. And um, I finally got published after, you know, multiple submissions um, by um, Random House, which is now Penguin uh, Random right. House. But I had gone through a, a long, quite a few years of, you know, sending out, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Bits. Almost and, a, almost and everybody yeah. does. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's that one of those baptisms of fire you have to mm-hmm. go. Through. It is. Um, and Darko was actually created on a character that I saw on a, a documentary from the, the West African country of Cote d'Ivoire, which okay. is like one uh, country west of ghana um and what 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 happened there was it was a a uh, a rural doctor uh-huh. a rural detective i'm sorry he okay. was yeah. um, the local police there and there was a murder and um he had to solve it and one of the ways methods he used was to to scare his witnesses and um suspects by threatening you know witchcraft on them things like that gotcha. okay and uh i said wow that's such an interesting concept because the thing about it is and you know i might mention it a little later re- in regards to african fiction is that 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 part of fiction mm-hmm. is very much a part of life there so you know a lot of this this supernatural stuff and spiritualism and stuff like that is quite real for everyday people living their everyday lives in interesting in okay yeah and so you know to manipulate those beliefs sure to get confessions i think i thought that was such an interesting concept absolutely yeah and and that's really what who darko was was based on um he was very rough when i first produced him um but you know i refined him a little bit but he was actually uh I, and the funny thing is was was the documentary was in french because i was in Paris at the time. So. Okay. Nice. 
but um, yeah, so that's what he was uh, uh, based on. And then now with Emma Jan, she arose, she's actually a, um, a product of the Me Too era. Okay. Yeah. Because about the time that I was including um, a, a female um, assistant to Darko Dawson, his mm -hmm. first female assistant, um, the Me Too movement had just about started then. Okay. And then, and uh, my aim had been to just make um, this new character, this new female uh, cop, a sort of consultant or um, a mentee of, um, you know, Darko. So Darko be sort of the the wise sage giving the the young rookie sure, advice. Sure. But um, Soho Press has said, no, 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 no. We got to have our own. <laughs> we got to have our own series because. You know, I left Random House and went to Soho Press. So I said, no, he, we, this has to be a totally new invention. So I, that's how Emma Jan was actually born. But the timing was just is, is spectacular in that at the time that I had, you know, come out, come with the concept of an Emma Jan was when mm -hmm. all that Me Too stuff was actually peaking. Okay. And it, was, it was one of those, you know, fortuitous, you know, time um things that just work out exactly the way you would like it yeah sure. so she was she's a very very topical let's say topical and modern young woman right you know? okay yeah. okay excellent excellent so i want to i want to show real quick here i'm, I'm going to pull up on the screen and i want to uh show real quick let's see the covers that you have uh, for your books, right? We've got we've got Wife of the Gods. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have the Darko Dawson series up top here, right? And and one of the things that we we briefly talked about uh, before this is that uh, I think both of us kind of un, um, think that book covers in general are underestimated. Oh yeah, and and you know the, they're the author should have. A serious say in what it looks like, unless they don't care. There will be some authors out there that, that will just say, "Hey, it, it 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 doesn't matter to me. Whatever you put on is fine." Then uh, okay, but but when that's not the case, and that's going to be a lot of the time, um, you can see here with your two series, you've got a you've got a real kind of um, aesthetic thing going on, right? With the yes. with the top here, totally different. Yeah, oh yeah, no, without different. question. But 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 in the series themselves, right? Like you can see down here, these covers, the Emma John covers, remind me a lot of uh, almost like the uh, the Black Lizard uh, vintage yes. crime kind of stuff. Which, I which, was just I was just about to say uh, has a, a something of a noirish look to it. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, and and yeah. they have uh, kind of you know these kind of shocks of color for sure. Yes, but, yes. But but they really kind of are reminiscent of that, which is cool. And then the ones on top have a have a, um, a also a very distinct kind of kind of feel. So why don't you go into that for just a second with regards to the covers? With I'd say with one exception, and that is Children of the Street mm -hmm. was the only one that I didn't like, and that was when I was ra with Random House at that or around that time. They've been laying off a lot of um, really good editors, and including one one of okay. mine who um, I worked with Wife of the Gods on. And this this cover I did not accept. I did not like it at all because I mean it has very little um, uh, character to it. Mm -hmm. It's not terribly mysterious. It looks like one of those um, UN. <laughs> United Nation pamphlets, uh, you know, <laughs> okay, yeah, I can it, see it, that. it's completely uninteresting. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like you said, they don't pay much attention to the what the author says. If the author says, um, I love it, they say, thanks very much. And if the author says, I hate it, they say, thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> but they have no interest in what you have to say. None. Huh. Zero. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, so needless to say, that didn't go through. But the other ones, I really liked. And then, when the uh, Emma Jan series came along, I just, I just said, "Wow, this is this, this is the one look that I just went for it immediately." I said, "Yes, that is just 
exactly right. That is exactly right. I had nothing to say. <laughs> right, right, right. No criticism whatsoever. No, none, zero. I said, you you have nailed it this time. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. Well, let's talk then about, you can see uh, last scene in La Paz right there on the screen, right? So so let's talk about that for a second because you've got, it's 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 the third book in the series. You've got it coming out in February, right? Yeah. Of, of, of 23. 2023, yeah. So, so talk to me uh, briefly about that. Kind of give us a, 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 a preview, if you would. Well, you know, there is um, a lot of movement between um, West African countries and between West African uh, uh, countries and Europe. Mm-hmm. And what is going on is there is an, there is an intra-West African um, uh, human trafficking okay. trade and sex trafficking trade. And then there's also sex trafficking from, say, um, the country of Niger mm-hmm. up to uh, Libya, and then uh, Libya across to to Italy. If you if you make it, okay, you may not make it. Okay. So what this story is about is a um, the, a background of human trafficking in the countries of uh, Ghana, Nigeria, and Niger. Which all of which I visited for for the research, um, and it it focuses on some of the the lives of people who are making that break from West Africa trying to get to Italy. Um, it, it it features a couple of well about three or four or maybe more characters who are going through this process. Uh huh. And then there's the Ghana side where Emma Jan is. Right. A murder occurs that appears to be connected to um, the disappearance of a young woman um, who is the daughter of, of the client who comes into to, um, to Emma's agency. Because Emma Emma's a PI. She's a private investigator. Right. And she works with a SOAR investigative um, agency. And so... Um, she is brought on to that um, as part of the part of the team, uh-huh. and um, yeah. Okay, excellent. Yeah, and and so when you say you you went to these West African countries and you you did the you did the research essentially, how explain how that how that works. Yeah, it was um, it was really up in the air. Um, there, the, the, first of all, you know, you shouldn't you should not go in in general. I would not advise um, an American of any shade <laughs> uh-huh. to go to Nigeria without uh, some kind of escort because okay. Nigeria can be rough. <laughs> it, uh, is that because? Is that because of danger or is that because of like uh, cons or what, you know, what kind of kidnappings? Okay. Gotcha. Things, violent crime. Okay. Um, in fact, there, I, there were two Ghanaians when I was in Ghana who said they, you couldn't pay them to go to Nigeria. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I, and that's why I said, you know, Nigeria versus Ghana. There's always that tension. Right, right, right. So, <laughs> So when you went to, do you get a guide or? Yes, I, I, okay. I, I arranged actually a tour, a modified tour for the things that I needed to find out. Sure. So um, they tailored it. It's a pair of brothers, um, the Agui brothers, <laughs> um, uh, Evans or Evans uh, and uh, Confidence, mm-hmm. They're two Nigerian brothers. I went with them. They went around with me and. I basically got to look at the things that would be um, relevant in last uh, scene in La Paz. Um, so then after that, it was to Niger. Now, Niger is where I got the surprise. I, I don't know, you may, prob- you may know a little bit about Niger. It's a landlocked, very large country, mm-hmm. kind of in the middle of um, West Africa, around you know the Chad area, and just and it's just south of Libya. Libya, it's a huge country. 
um, you know, it, it has good resources, but it's not, it's not a developed country. Okay. It's one of the youngest and most um, underdeveloped countries um, in okay. West Africa. And so now, what, was, what was the surprise there? Because supposedly, if, uh -huh. you, if, you, if you Google anything on Niger, you get the, almost a, an echo effect of one of the most dangerous places to live. Kidnappings, killings, shootings, murders. So when I got to Niger, I was ready to duck from flying. Right, right. Right? right. What did I see? People putzing around on three-wheeled um, um, tricycles that are the taxis mm -hmm. at about the grand speed of four miles per hour. You know, mopeds everywhere. Uh, who's kidnapping who here? <laughs> right, right. I mean, what, what are you talking about? All you see is people going along, with minding their own business, going about business every day, as an, um, and as a matter of fact, showing a hell of a lot more courtesy than we do in the United States. Okay. Don't, don't pass a guy in the street without, you know, greeting them, you know? And so, and you have this kind of camaraderie, you know, people like to touch their chest when they, when they say, you know, salam alaikum. And uh -huh. there's a real feeling of brotherhood and sisterhood that okay. you can't can get in the USA. And this is the country which, if you, if you, you know, look in the press, it is one of the most, um, vilified countries Interesting. in the world. And the, and the reason for that is everybody's using, is reading everybody else's blogs. Right. One blog says, this is a really terrible place to go. And so you just echo it in your next blog. And that's how it got perpetrated. Hmm. But it's, it's a very, very, very unfair um, judgment of that country. There are some, um, some skirmishes at the borders but uh -huh. to make it seem that the entire country is engulfed in some horrific, right. you know, um, um, spree of killing and right, uh, you know, it's it's just unfair because yeah, they're not sure. like that. It's, they are yeah. not like that. Right. So that was so that was a, pre a, a pleasant surprise. Then it was a wonderful surprise. Wonderful surprise. And I mean, awesome. you know, the people couldn't have been nicer. <laughs> right. <laughs> You know, right. and then and and I sort of felt I almost felt a, kind of ashamed for like having believed everything I'd read. Sure, and coming sure. there with that pre predestined prejudicial. Mm -hmm. Right, right. You just like swap. You just like swallowed it hook, line, and sinker. And, yeah, and, I, yeah. Oh, I swallowed the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. whole thing. I did, and and you know, I should know better. I should know better. Yeah. Okay. All right. Excellent. Well, so explain to me though, and obviously without giving, you know, details away from the, from the book, but, uh, when you're there and you're saying you're doing this, this research in these, yeah. in these countries, are you talking research with regards to like the, the, um, human trafficking and, and, and sex trade? Yes. Yes. When I was in Nigeria, I interviewed it. It, fe it features a number of people crossing from Nigeria into Niger and then Niger to Libya across the Sahara Desert, which is a treacherous journey. Oh, I can imagine. Terrible, treacherous journey. Um, and so what, I'm, what I was interested in in Nigeria was talking to some of these returnees, as they, they, they call them sometimes migrant returnees, who, okay. have, who have survived and lived to tell sure. the tale. Sure. And um, I met uh, six young uh, women and one man who um, had made the trip and they told me all about the, you know, the horrors of it, of, of you know, when you're crossing the Sahara, you know, you could be picked up by um, either bandits or you could be picked up by the authorities, either one. So, you know, wow. you gotta, you gotta drive like a bat out of hell. Sure. Through there. And the, the thing is, you know, there's no stopping. If somebody falls off and they, they pack you in, in the back of one of these trucks, mm -hmm. uh, like a F-10 maybe body, and they pack, you know, um, 20, 30 people into there. And, you know, if, if, you, if you're on the edge with your legs dangling, because that's the only way they can fit everybody in. If, if you fall out, they're not stopping for you. You will die in the desert. And, I mean, it's, it was... 
one of the people I interviewed said that they started out with 25 and when, when they got to Libya, there were 10 of them. Mm. Yeah. Wow. It, it's just, just really horrendous. So I did talk to them. And then um, in Ghana, I also I talked to people who were on that side of the, um, the trade. They get a lot of traffic in from Nigeria because, because Ghana is in general more prosperous than Nigeria, in spite of no. the fact that Nigeria has all the oil. But um, the Nigerians tend to, tended to go to Ghana. And okay. so that, there's that trade going on as well. And there's a totally different type of sex work in Ghana as well. It's, it's much more um, IT-based, much more ba- um, web-based and, and, um, and app-based. Okay. Uh, really? Then, okay. Yes. 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 They, they, you know, I think in fact that pimps may go out of style because the women have discovered, well, I got my cell phone. <laughs> I do not need the man in the middle. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Okay. Very powerful. Very, very powerful. Interesting. So, and, and so this is, this is, I mean, we're talking here about last scene in the pause, right? And, and this is uh, an, an Emma book. So, yes. So, and, and if she's coming from the, you know, kind of a, a, a from the Me Too movement in a way, yeah. right? Um, yeah, I can see, I can see that could be a really kind of explosive yeah. novel. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, you know, you, you'll see, you sort of see her, the contrast in her, her way of think, thinking against one of um, her colleagues who's a, a much older male. Sure. And oh, I can imagine. Yeah. The total difference between the way they look at the same, the same things. And, and that's some yeah. of the fun about writing uh, Emma because she's, I mean, she's what? She's 26 now, 26, 27. So she's a thoroughly modern woman, mm-hmm. you know, and she's come up in a, a different age than, you know, her mom and her grandma. Yeah. Right. You know? Oh, absolutely, and yeah. that's one of the things that that people who people who are say they're they're readers, or even if they're not readers, say they enjoy movies and things like that. But one of the things that people who aren't writers don't get is it's so much fun to write completely contrasting characters like that. Oh, you know, yeah. To develop these personality traits that that you personally would never think about yes. but 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 you can just go with them in you yes. know, in, in in fiction which is a lot that, of that is a that is the freedom that the fiction you know um gives gives to you it's, it's kind of like a gift you mm-hmm. know because um i mean i have laughed out loud sometimes you know at some of the characters i've <laughs> sure. drawn sure then but i've also uh, i've also cried for when you know a favorite character of mine dies or is killed mm-hmm. um I've, I've also uh, so i've done both i've i've laughed and i've cried sure. yeah. and, and that's something else people might not know is that you do have your favorite characters like even oh, if, yeah even if they're not one of the the main characters or a protagonist they might yes. they might be a side character that you just write yes. about a little bit but you really have an affinity yeah. for this character and then all of a sudden the story dictates or what have what have you that you know they need to go yeah um it, it I, have, I have a, i have a character in um sleep well my lady which is um the the number two um emma jan and she's a she's a cuban doctor mm-hmm. who um the cubans have um a program of sending out their doctors to underserved areas in um, africa south america and so on and um this cuban doctor a uh, sort of vivacious, young, you know, snappy uh, doc, um, doctor who, you know, she runs a tight sh- ship right. over there. Uh, and um, she's, uh, she's very glamorous. And, and um, Emma meets her and mm-hmm. they, kind, they kind of bond. Sure. Um, and this, I mean, this woman is like, she's just, she's kind of like the, the energizing buddy, you know, she's got like endless pace, um, energy. And, but that was actually based on a real Cuban doctor I met uh, when I went to the mortuary in Accra, Ghana. Mm-hmm. I met a Cuban, she was fantastic. Mm-hmm. And just almost the way I described her in the book, I mean, she was just so sharp. And um, she had those, those bodies rolling. <laughs> right, right. Excellent. Like, a, like a, um, you know, a, 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 an assembly line. This is amazing. This is yeah. amazing. Yeah. yeah. And it yeah. hurts. And it hurts when you have to part with characters. Yeah. Yeah. It does. Yeah. It does. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. So, so, you know, you get your favorites, like that one was one of my favorites and she, she's going to come back in um, the, the next one for 2024. So she, is that she? Okay, good. good. Yeah. Yeah. I like to bring back the, 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 you know, the, the sort of quirky characters. Sure. Everyone, Absolutely. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. And, and you know, what's also interesting is every once in a while you'll get a, you'll get a character that you really don't like much, but you recognize his or her importance to yeah. the story and you can even have a little bit of fun writing that yeah. character, you know, because Absolutely. It, it might bring out an aspect of your, of your personality that you would never <laughs> express normally. But, you know, yes, you know, I mean, if you if you if you describe him as a let's say you say he was an odious little man, you know, <laughs> you know, yeah. you yeah. know, the author is taking and like, you know, having fun with this. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. It, it, <laughs> And you know the author's never sitting there going, "I'm putting myself in his shoes." You know, of, of course not. You just described yourself as an odious little man. So this is a character that you're not crazy about. It's just you know you got to write him. I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh, it's fun. It's fun. It's, it's fun. fun. No, a lot of fun, Brian. <laughs> it, is. it is. All right. So so let's change gears here real quick, just because yeah. just, just because, like I said in the beginning, it is it is a. a, a I don't want to say it's a paradox per se, but it's it's certainly uncommon, right, to find somebody who not only has a, you know a medical doctor degree, but but also who practiced medicine for twenty years, right? Yeah, yeah, twenty plus, um, yeah. Internal medicine, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. and, okay. and uh, so, urgent care too. Yeah. Or, okay, so urgent care also. So so practicing, you know, physician for twenty years. Um, so how how did you started writing when you were very young and you, and yeah. you always kind of kept that in mind. Right. Right. But, but how did you transition into becoming a doctor and then, you know, going back? <laughs> no, to it, no, it was, it was the other way around. Okay. Um, when I, when I was about 13, 14, I, I had already decided I wanted to be a doctor. So, you know, mm -hmm. I, I started that just the, the pitch, um, the, um, process science to med school. Uh -huh. And, um, and then, you know, I got, uh, I got my MD, but then, and that's when I returned to my interest in writing. Okay. Yeah. And I had always wanted to do it, but I, I just couldn't do it um, <clears throat> during med school because oh, sure. it was too, just too hard. By the, by the way, um, Michael Crichton supposedly uh, yeah. wrote one book when he was an intern. I, I'm sorry. I refuse <laughs> to do it. <laughs> that, that's too painful for me to right. think of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He he's the only one I can think of. I'm I I'm not. There might be many others. I don't know, but I don't think so. But oh yeah, the, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle was okay. Um, okay. Somerset Maugham was. Uh, who else? Michael Crichton, Robin Cook. Oh, Rob. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Those were actually there are quite a few. For some okay. reason, I I don't know what it is. Okay. Um, okay. But, uh, and so there are quite a few. And so you're you're um routine right when you were when you were a practicing doctor and you were also writing was was you do it in the morning is that yeah um you know clinic starts at eight so i would try to get to the office uh, by six uh-huh and get get some work done but you know a lot of time i had to use you know answering emails so let's say <laughs> sure, yeah yeah so maybe it ended up ended up only one and a half hours and then when I got home, I usually didn't didn't write. Okay. But I, you know, I managed. To, you know, after being <laughs> there for years, I I sort of uh, dealed and wielded um, and got myself a Wednesday off. Uh huh. And then a half day Thursday. <laughs> okay. So okay. I was I was gradually eating into my doctor time and increasing my writing. Right. And um, I even I I told. I told work, I, I warned everybody, I said, I probably will retire in about two years. And I made no secret about it. Mm -hmm. So that when it, it happened, everybody knew it was going to happen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah, no surprise. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah, it was perfect. So that meant early morning writing. Uh -huh. Once I retired, that shifts things a lot. I would imagine, yeah. Yes, <laughs> because there are a lot of things you can now do in the morning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and then free up your afternoon. Now, I know some people like to write in the morning, like say to noon, mm -hmm. 
but yeah, you can you can count my, you yeah. can count me in on that. That that I really? usually I usually whatever time I wake up, I'll usually spend two to three when I'm when I'm actively working on something. I'll spend two to three hours in the morning just mm -hmm. knocking that out, and then the afternoon is pretty much free. Like I don't I don't work on writing at all, and then sometimes I'll edit at night, you know. But the actual the the content, you know, the the, the creative content is mostly in the morning for me. Mm. Yeah, you, you, I tend to um, like things like um, doctor appointments, going to the cleaner and stuff like that, uh, getting a car wash and stuff like that. I it's, I try to do mornings. You do that morning, yeah. Okay. Right, and then have the afternoon sure. uh, free. But the other thing about, about you know, um, having more time <clears throat> is that it kind of gives you a little bit of flexibility as to what you can put off. I mean, if you don't get something done today, you can probably do it tomorrow because you don't have clinic to go yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, made, yeah, it made, it made a tr tremendous uh, difference. And I mean, I think you can see, you know, between 2009 and 2000, uh, let's say, yeah, 18, that's uh, that's like five. That's five Darko Dawson books in mm -hmm. in oh, let's say ten years. Okay. So one 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 every two years. But now, so between twenty twenty and twenty twenty four, there would have been four Emma Jans. Right. That's one a year. So it 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 doubled. Right. Right. Okay. And yeah. and I I I think I remember. And if I'm incorrect, you know, correct me. But. I'm pretty sure I saw a, a post of yours recently that said you were slightly disappointed in yourself because you wanted to do one book a year and you had felt you had fallen a little bit behind. Yeah. <laughs> like for like, you know, for like um, the the one coming out in February last year, mm -hmm. uh, last in La Paz, that actually originally had, had been slated for June uh -huh. 2022. Mm -hmm. But you see what happened was because of COVID. Yeah, I lost. I lost a year of um, research. I would have gone to Ghana in 2020 uh, to do. Sure, of course, research. of course. Yeah. So I lost that one, and so one and when, and when I did get to go to to uh, Ghana in that's 2021, mm -hmm. I was sort of still writing the last scene in La Paz. Uh huh. And then I just discovered so many different things that I had to go back and, and put those in. And then before you knew it, uh, there was no way I, uh, I, had, I would have it ready. Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. So hey. what happens with the book thing is like the airport. If, you, <laughs> if the airplane misses a slot, you join the back of the queue. Mm -hmm. So because I couldn't get out in June, you know, the, the rest of the, the, the year is filled up. So, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So it has to go in, into the, the following year. Yeah. I, I had no choice. No choice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So so when you when you plot out a book, because you, you primarily write novels, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when you plot out a book, how are you somebody that because you know, every writer works with a different process. Are you somebody that that has everything planned out in advance, like a like a uh uh strictly linear kind of outline or are you somebody who has you know like this bullet point and this bullet point and this bullet point and then you know you just kind of fill in the blanks yeah i see you know i see the the novel more <clears throat> not so much like a a powerpoint presentation but more like a movie okay so it, things are flowing much much better and then that also allows me to jump back and forth in time it okay. doesn't bother yeah. me. It doesn't bother me at all. All right. And um, so I do have an outline, uh, and I think. Well, I don't know for for whatever reason, Soho Press has always preferred to get an outline from me, and that's how okay. that's how I started with them. Okay. And um, they, and do you also, and do you do you deviate from that sometimes? Like if you have an outline, but then say you know a third of the way into this scene, you, you realize, eh, I could actually tweak this or add this in. Do you? Oh, yeah. Do that? Okay. Oh, yeah. That's uh, the okay. whole fun of it. Yeah, yeah it is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's the whole fun of it. Because basically, it's just like a roadmap. Mm -hmm. um, 
I mean, you can go from A to B, but then if you if you like, you could you know go to um, from A to uh, S, and then come double back to P, and then you know come back yeah. to your B, yeah. whatever. Yeah, that's the whole fun of it because then the the story starts taking you know its own twists and it turns. Does. And, it does. You know, like some of the gun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah I like, so that's a good part. I like the roadmap metaphor there because it because for me it's it's all sometimes it's those little stops that you're not sure you're going to make when you start out on the road trip that ends yeah, up making yeah. the whole thing work out that's you know? a, that's another thing of, another way of looking at it that you know you 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 had you sort of had mapped out a certain pace but mm -hmm. then as you get to writing you realize the pace has to it can't be on all the time or off all right. the time right there has to be you know some crescendos and you know some mm -hmm and tone downs and stuff so so that's like you know having a stop you know at a you know rest a rest place and, yeah, you know, yeah it's another good a good way of looking at it yeah okay. all right so so talk to me real quick about who are some who are some writers out there um either past or or present uh that you that you um either it either consider influences or just enjoy reading you know, because because uh, you know, you had mentioned you mentioned Agatha Christie, uh, uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, right. and um, for me personally, it's more along the lines of like uh, Jim Thompson, Raymond Chandler, Walter Mosley, yes. you know, those guys. Uh, uh, Patricia Highsmith too, uh, great, and so and none of those with the exception of Mosley are still around, but, but uh, who are, who are, who are some folks that you, uh, you enjoy reading either, you know, past, present, whatever. Well, uh, well, with you, I get, you were sort of more on the, the noirish side and yeah, I was on yeah. the, um, the sort of deductive, deductive sure. mystery type. Sure. Um, so there's, there's a difference and, between detective fiction, I think personally, detective and, fiction and more hard boiled, and, noir absolutely. Stuff, you know, so absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, I, part of what I read was, you know, in part because of, you know, the, the legacy of, of British colonialism. Of so course, of course, yeah. We, a lot of the, the books that we had in, in the house were by British authors. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what proportion, but I mean, I mean, you know, we had American authors, of course. We had Henry Miller, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> and, and, you know, the thing about my, my uh, house was that every once in a while, I'd come across a book I hadn't seen before. Mm -hmm. And I can't figure out, did mom and dad buy this one and just bring it? Or have I just missed it? It was amazing. Right. Right. And um, that's where I read, uh, I read Henry Miller. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said, I'm not sure if mom wants this to be on here. But, <laughs> right. but my mom had no qualms about it. Because I asked her once, I said, is it okay if I read this? She said, yeah, I'll put it there for you. <laughs> there you go. Good. Good for mom. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so you know the the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's um, Doris, uh, Dorothy Sayers and people like those were that was be definitely the the British influence and I also yeah. read another British author who was a children's author but but um, and she wrote um, hard mysteries I guess the equivalent of say let's say Hardy Boys okay um, yeah that equivalent and I read I read her a lot and uh, she she taught me something about uh, the twists twists and surprises so. I, I learned quite a bit from her, yeah. So, yeah, those those are some of my now in modern time. I really like this author, the Swedish author Henning Mankell. Okay, uh, I just like the way he has this sort of free association, you know, in his um, in Kurt Ballander's head. Uh, you know, thoughts just pop in and out of his head, and sure, and he paints such a drab, gray, miserable old scene, right? Which is you know the Scandi noir, which um, we're, we're trying to we're trying to counteract that with them Afro, Afro noir now. You mm -hmm. know, bring some sunlight in here. You know, right, right. So yeah, and so I really like him. And then um, let's see who who else um, Mosley's I have liked a lot. Mm -hmm. um, uh, let's see some others. Yeah, those those are some of the okay. the ones that. Oh, I used to read um, Patricia Cornwell a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, haven't read her in quite a while, um, but but she definitely was one of the people who 
um, got me in, in reading her, got me interested in, in the autopsy as ah, okay. part of the mystery solving. Excellent. Um, she was very good at that. And um, that, in fact, she spurred me on to do a, a residency in, um, well, no, not a residency, but just, I think, a, like a two-month stint at the, um, the mortuary at LA, LA County USC uh, Medical Center. So, All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I really admired her. I admired her quite a bit. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Awesome, man. Well, well, look, so, so we're going to, we're going to, we're going to shut it down here soon. Um, enjoy having you on when we finish here, stay with me for a couple minutes and we'll talk. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so first off, uh, again, for everybody, this is Quay Quarte. Uh, He's got, um, last seen in La Paz coming out in February of 2023 on Soho press. Yeah. Yeah. Soho press on the 7th of February. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So February 7th. Um, it's got a it's got a great cover. It's got a great protagonist. I personally, after hearing everything tonight, I look forward to uh, giving it a read. And um, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank uh, you, Brian. Absolutely. With, with with regards to us and 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 Starlight Pulp, um, this is going to be the last podcast for a little bit, just because holidays are coming up and there's there's yeah. all the madness of that. So, uh, yeah. but but we do have two books coming out in just the next couple of weeks. Uh, the first one is uh, the Starlight Pulp review right here. And uh, we've got 12 different authors in this. I just literally, Quay, uh, an hour before I was meeting with you, I was opening the first boxes of books that we got. So, um, so that's kind of cool. So these will be these will be on sale uh, shortly. It's 340 pages of of, of goodness, uh, and these will be on sale. Uh, these will be on sale hopefully next week. Uh, certainly by the week after that, if not, uh, pre sales will be available as well. Uh, and um, we are going to have an event, uh, Cathedral City, December 17th at an art gallery out here, the J.J. Harrington Art Gallery. Uh, Koi, if you're available, I'd, I'd love for you to come by. We're going to have at least two or three other authors who are in there. Oh, room, yeah, nice. Uh, come read, and yeah. uh, we'll sign whatever books are sold and all that kind of stuff. So come on out. And um, otherwise, everybody, thanks so much. Well, the other thing I, the yeah. other thing I just wanted to ask, um, do you do any book giveaways? I should have thought of this before. I, um, I don't know how you would do um do that i i have like um one um advanced reading copy of last scene of la paz if mm -hmm. um but i don't know how it, i would set it up i i should have thought of it before oh no, that's fine yeah. yeah um yeah i mean i i we have i like i said i just got these books in today so <laughs> i'm just looking through them right now but i mean um like i said we'll have them on pre-sale uh next week and and you know we'll uh all, all the contributors, obviously, they get their they get their copies and all that. But yeah, so um, so again, everybody, thanks for checking in. Uh, this is Mr. Quay Quarte. It has been my pleasure, and uh, see everybody soon. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. In this topsy turvy.